So, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, a very special virtual tasting with myself, Chris White, uh, editor at Edinburgh Whiskey Blog and auctioneer at Royal Mile Whiskey Auctions. Thank you very much for tuning in this evening. Um, and thank you again uh, as well to everyone who bought uh, one of the very limited dram packs. Uh, the lineup tonight is undoubtedly one of the most spectacular lineups of whiskey I've had the pleasure and the, and the privilege of talking about in my, my 12 years in the whiskey industry. Um, and as much as this tasting is about uh, tasting some extraordinary, rare and exceptionally old whiskies, um, the reason for this tasting has, has really come about uh, due to the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm here down in a warehouse in Leith, uh, here in the Leith Spirits warehouse, um, where uh, this family-owned uh, local company has suspended their spirit production and focused solely on producing possibly the equivalent of gold dust right now, um, hand sanitizer. I've got a bottle just here. Um, before I speak any more about the whiskies or about the um, about why we're here tonight, I'd like to invite Greg from uh, from Lee Spirits to say a little bit more uh, about this product. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to first of all start by just saying thanks again and reiterate to Chris uh, what Chris was saying about people supporting this tasting. It's obviously for a, a cause that we've, we've got involved in, which was, as Chris was saying, uh, making sanitizer, which we've been providing to uh, local emergency services and frontline workers and care homes, and even local businesses to help them keep functioning and, and serving the public with, with food and things like that. So yeah, it started as very much, uh, can we do this? Do we, do we have access to the raw materials to do that? And with a bit of research and um, a lot of hard work on the on the phones and on the emails, we managed to pull together all the resources to get this off the ground as quick as we could. Um, by the end of next week, we should be in and around 25,000 bottles that we've, we've put out in total since production. Um, so we'd like to think we've helped as many people as we can. And obviously more people are now doing hand sanitizer as well, which is great. Everyone's pulling together and trying to help people keep doing what they need to do to keep everyone healthy and safe. Um, Obviously, Chris is going to be going on about the whiskies. That's that, we've got the best guy for the job that for that tonight. Um, so I'll, I'll hand you back to Chris, and he'll uh, talk you through this amazing lineup. And I'll stand and, and listen along and have a dram along with you. So enjoy the tasting and uh, enjoy enjoy your time with Chris. And thank you very much. Cheers. It's a bit strange in a tasting where it's one in one out with social distancing, isn't it? But uh, yeah, so, so like, like Greg said, that's, that's the reason why we're here. Um, I'm here primarily to talk you through, through the liquids to the, the 20 of you that, um, that bought the, the dram packs. Um, don't worry if you didn't manage to get your hands on one of the dram packs. Just grab a bottle off the shelf at home, whatever you have, have a dram along with me. Uh, enjoy uh, this virtual tasting tonight and please, by all means, uh, comment on the stream. Uh, let me know what you're drinking. Uh, ask any questions that, that you might have. We'll try and get along, uh, get through as many as possible. And if you see me checking my phone uh, as we go through tonight, uh, that's simply because uh, Timna, who's looking after the, the stream and managing the comments this evening, uh, she's going to WhatsApp me uh, your questions from a, a socially safe distance. Uh, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, if there are any questions we can't get through, I will go back through uh, the chat tomorrow and, and try to answer uh, everybody's questions uh, that, that you might have. So. Uh, so the link this evening, like I say, for those of you that do have the dram packs, you know what treat you're in for. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary lineup, and all the whiskies for, for tonight's tasting have been donated by, uh, very generously donated uh, by the owner of Lee Spirits, which is, is Derek Mayer. Um, it consists primarily of cask samples, so whiskies that you would never ever uh, usually be able to taste, and only one of tonight's five drams is a commercial bottled, bottled product. Uh, and we'll get to that um, at the second dram with the Brew Gladi. Um, all monies raised from the, the sale of these dram packs has, has gone towards the continued production uh, of Leith Spirits hand sanitizer, uh, a completely philanthropic, non for profit initiative. Um, and it's a privilege to be here to be able to talk about these whiskies that have been donated for this tasting uh, with you tonight. Um, in, in order of, of what we're going to dram with, we're going to start. Um, with 
no biggie, it's just a 1992 Rosebank cask sample. Uh, we're then going to move on to a 22-year-old Brook Laddie, a 1994 vintage. Um, I'll show you the bottle here. This is the only one that is a, a commercial product. It's bottled as part of Glenmore Spirits, parent company of Leith Spirits, uh, under their rare find range uh, for the bottle old and, and rare whiskey. So uh, that's going to be whiskey number two. Moving on to whiskey number three, we, we move into something a bit uh, darker and dirtier with a, a sherry Jura. That's a 1976 cask sample. Um, then possibly the jewel in the crown. I don't know um, how many of you have tasted 50 year old Macallan. Uh, I don't think I have, so that's, I'm thoroughly looking forward to that. That's a 1969 uh, Macallan cask sample as number four. And then number five, uh, we're finishing on a Kalila 1983 cask sample. So that's about uh, 36 years old, that, that last one. Uh, so that's the lineup. Um, I've got my nosing glasses in front of me. Um, those of you that have bought dram packs, uh, this likely isn't your first rodeo. Uh, I imagine you have participated in a number of whiskey tastings before, so you'll, you'll know the drill. Uh, get everything set up. Uh, these are all old whiskey, so feel free to pre pour them. Uh, the guys uh, and girls in the team here already have. With such old whiskies as this, you do want to let them breathe for a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start pouring my rose bank uh, to start with. And if everybody's sitting comfortably, uh, then we'll begin. Um, I'm only going to pour half of each sample. I think these are very special whiskies. Uh, so I'm going to save half of uh, each of the, the samples for, um, for a very special uh, future, future occasion. So, uh, and I want to be fairly sober and not slurring my words by the end of it as well. So, so let's crack on to the first whiskey. Um, and like I say, it's from Rosebank, the King of the Lowlands, uh, as it's affectionately called. Um, it's a long closed distillery. It closed um, in late 1993. But it has been in the news quite a lot recently, ever since that magical week in October 2017. I'm sure a lot of you remember it. Um, I think on the Monday morning at 9 o'clock, Diageo announced they were reopening Portel and Ambrora. And then on the Tuesday, uh, the new owners of Rosebank, Ian McLeod, announced they were going to reopen this site. Uh, I woke up on the Wednesday morning half thinking that St Magdalene or somebody else was going to reopen. Uh, sadly, it wasn't to be, uh, but it's great news that this um, very much revered Lowland Distillery is going to reopen its doors uh, likely later this year. It's located not too far from where I am at the moment, just a few miles along the N9 in Falkirk, um, at the junction of the Forth and Clyde canals. Um, as I say, as, as we go through each of the whiskies, uh, feel free for those of you that, that have got a dram pack at home uh, to nose and taste that at your own leisure. Um, while I give you a bit of background on the whiskies, I'll talk about various points uh, to do with whiskey as we go through. Uh, you don't need to wait un until I'm done talking, so uh, by all means, uh, comment on the stream, let us know what you think of the whiskey, what you're nosing, what you're tasting. Um, I'm sure your, your tasting notes will be relayed to me by, by Tim, and we'll have a good, a good chat about each of the drams. So Rosebank, much like a lot of very old distilleries, its early history is very, very sketchy. Uh, there are records from 1798 uh, from a pair of Stark brothers distilling uh, on the site likely illegally. And then there is mention uh, about 20 years later, so 1817, a certain James Rankin uh, opened a Rosebank distillery, uh, but we don't know where that distillery was, if it was even on the site of the distillery that we know as Rosebank today. The Rosebank that we do know today is essentially a tale of two distilleries, Camelin and Rosebank. Uh, and they were sort of on different sides of, of this canal. So, 1827, John Stark, one of the, the brothers I mentioned from the late 1700s, he set up Camelin on the west bank with its maltings on the east. Then in 1840, a chap called James Rankin came along and he either bought the Camelin maltings or leased them. Like I say, records were sketchy, we're not quite sure. Um, and he converted Camelin's maltings into what we now know as Rosebank. In 1861, Camelin went bankrupt. Rosebank was flourishing. So Rankin used a lot of his money to purchase uh, the Camelin distillery, totally demolished it and built Rosebank's maltings there. So we've got Rosebank's maltings on the West Bank and the rest of the production site on the East. And there are stories and anecdotes of malted barley being carted over a swing bridge in wheelbarrows uh, to get from the maltings uh, into, into the tun room. Uh, it produced pretty much continually uh, from there on right up until its closure in 1993. 
1914, it was one of the founders of Scottish Malt Distillers, and in 1925, it was folded in to the Distillers Company Limited, DCL, um, one of the primary precursors to what is modern day Diageo. Its closure um, was brought around by two key, key points. Um, firstly, the urban sprawl in the community were starting to impinge around the distillery, so there was issues with road access. Uh, there were also uh, a huge amount of investment needed to upgrade the effluent treatment plant, uh, something that Diageo weren't prepared to do. And that was really the final nail in the coffin uh, after Glen Kinchy had been chosen as the Lowland representative when the classic malt range went live in 1988. Uh, Glen Kinchy was chosen for a couple of reasons over Rosebank. Primarily, if you've been to, to Glen Kinchy, it's about 18 miles southeast of Edinburgh in a village called Pinkaitland. Uh, in amongst lots of lovely rolling hills of barley, so plenty of room for expansion and also a great tourist site as well. Uh, whereas at the time, Rosebank was next to um, a, a fairly bad eyesore, a fairly stagnant canal at that point in time. Um, and like I say, it was also hemmed in by roads and other buildings around about it, so there was no room for expansion there. And that really sealed the end of Rosebank in 1993. Most of us thought that that would be the end of it. Uh, I think one of the buildings was converted into a restaurant, a beef eater, if I remember correctly. Uh, a lot of the equipment was still there, um, but the stills, I think the mashton as well, was stolen uh, over the Christmas period of 2008. How you managed to steal a pot still, <laughs> it's beyond me, but good luck to the guys that did. Uh, they were never recovered. Uh, they're made of copper, obviously, a very uh, valuable metal, so likely melted down and sold off. Uh, and we thought that was the end of Rosebank. But very recently, Ian McLeod, uh, who own Glengoyne and Tam Du, bought the trademark uh, and the remaining stock. It was around about 100 casks uh, from Diageo. And like I say, that magical week in October 2017, they announced that they were going to reopen the distillery. Uh, I think the timeline for recommencing production was later this autumn. Whether that still happens due to the current climate, I'm not quite sure, but that was the plan. And they were going to very much take Rosebank back and try and recreate the spirit that was being produced at the site prior to its closure in 1993. And it had really quite a strange setup. Uh, if you're familiar with, with whiskey production, um, the whiskey at Rosebank was triple distilled, much like Ockintoshan, for example, in Glasgow, and much like a lot of Irish whiskey. Uh, triple distillation tends to give rise to a very estuary light floral style of spirit. Um, but at the same time, worm tubs were used as condensers rather than shell and tube condensers. And worm tubs tend to um, give rise to a heavier, oilier, uh, meaty spirit. Uh, so you've got this sort of juxtaposition, this paradoxical uh, production of triple distillation, uh, but then worm top condensers. So it gave rise to a very layered and complex spirit. Um, what I like to do before we go into the tasting, I will sort of do tasting notes as we go along as a little bit of a guide. I've not tasted any of these whiskies apart from the, the Brook Laddie uh, before, so these are all new to me as well. But what I like to do in tastings, and I do it uh, a lot when I do uh, tastings from uh, the, the used whiskies that have different vintages. You know, you go into a bar or you go, uh, go in, into a whiskey tasting and somebody plonks down a 15 or a 21 or a 25 year old whiskey in front of you. You sort of look at it and you go, God, 21 years, that, that's, that's a good age, that's going to be a great whiskey. But you don't maybe necessarily think about what was going on in the world 21 years ago when that whiskey was being born. Uh, so with this Rosebank, uh, it's a 1992 uh, cask sample. I'll give you a bit of details on uh, the whiskey first of all. So the cask was filled in February of 92. Um, the sample was drawn uh, just last month, so it's 28 years old. Uh, it's from a refill hogshead, and the current cask strength is 52.3%. So still, still quite a pretty punchy start, um, at that sort of cask strength. Uh, so that's, that's the whiskey. And what was going on in 1992? Uh, this is a bit of nostalgia. Um, I certainly found it nostalgic researching this kind of thing. Um, but like I say, it also just gives you a sense of time, um, a sense of how much time has passed um, and how much, how long this cask has been slumbering in a warehouse, maturing this whiskey. Uh, so in 1992, and I, I will refer to notes here now, um, Bill Clinton was elected the US president. Uh, the Maastricht Treaty was signed to form the EU. Uh, Things that I love are more films and music of the time. Uh, films, Basic Instinct came out. We all remember that uncrossing and recrossing the legs scene, I'm sure we do. Uh, Reservoir Dogs, an absolute classic. Um, and The Bodyguard came out as well. In terms of music, 
I mentioned the bodyguard. Obviously, Whitney Houston with I Will Always Love You came out at the time. Um, an absolute classic 90s floor filler here. Snap, rhythm as a dancer, who remembers that? It's a melting tune. Um, and Nirvana smells like teen spirit. So that's the sort of stuff that was going on in the world in 1992 when this whiskey uh, was being distilled and filled into casks. So uh, for those of you that have a dram pack, uh, if you've noticed and tasted it already, um, I'll, I'll check my phone and just see if anything can be passed on to me. Um, see there's a few comments, a few notifications. So get your teeth into this whiskey, give it a good nose. See, even at that sort of high strength, it is still very, very approachable. Absolutely beautiful example of Rosebank. It's got this very sort of old limoncello or lemongrass, very citrusy, soft orchard fruits, but then a really creamy vanilla undertone. That sort of creamy weightiness really coming from those worm tubs. Um, and a lot of the notes that V. Phil Hogg says are great for maturing whiskey long term. They don't smash the spirit with lots of woody notes. They allow the spirit to develop nice and slowly over a long, long maturation. Great example of Rosebank. Slange. That's good. A little bit of white pepper, fresh ginger, nice spicy star. Then moving into those floral things. It's quite oily, quite waxy. Again, that mouthfeel being attributed to the, the method of, of condensing in those warm tubs. Quite oily. Almost uh, sort of beeswaxy or uh, sort of waxed cricket bat. We're moving into the aromatic woods now, maybe a touch of sandalwood uh, as well. Oh, it's gorgeous, absolutely delightful. A little bit of water here as well, so feel free to dilute your whiskey um, as we're going through. I'm going to just touch to this, not too much. Uh, it doesn't really need too much of this, but likely with, with diluting, we're going to open those, those floral and fruity notes up a bit more. Yeah, it's becoming very lemony, kiwi, grapefruit, that sort of thing. Very bright whiskey. Not at all tired for 28 years old either. The wood influence is very, very restrained. It's not dry, it's not, it's not tired, it's very, very bright, vibrant. Mm. God, that's delicious. Now, is that a question from Daryl Halliday? So there's a few few guys on the on the stream tonight. Um, I know that are very very excited about the third round this evening the Jura. Uh, a big shout out to the guys from White Mackay that have bought uh, tasting packs for tonight. Uh, Daryl, as you've already commented, uh, Daryl Halliday, uh, Andrew Lenny, the Fetiker ambassador, is also online. Uh, I think Stevie Martin is as well. So a big shout out to those guys. Thanks for supporting. Uh, Daryl, would like to know who you are wearing this evening. Uh, well, I'd like to say I'm wearing Tom Ford, but I don't get paid enough for that. So, uh, but the, the shirt's from T.M. Lewin, if you must know. So, uh, thank you, thanks for, for commenting on my appearance. Um, the hair's a little bit long. I've not had my lockdown haircut yet. It's a little bit shaggy dog, but we'll uh, we'll get that seen in the next few days, no doubt. Uh, so, those of you that do have the rose bank in front, keep commenting. Let me know what you think. Um, there is there is no rush to this. By all means, I'm going to leave a little bit in my glass. Come back to it later with whiskies of this age. Uh, remarkably, I think this is the second youngest whiskey in the lineup, and it's still 28. Uh, these will, these whiskies will definitely evolve over time as we progress through the tasting. So, going to give that a little bit of time to sit and open up, um, and maybe move on to whiskey number two, which, like I say, is the only commercial product that we've got this evening, um, and that's from Brutlady, that's part of Glenmore Spirits' rare find range. So, Brutlady is a quite a checkered history. It's got a very, very interesting beginning. Um, it was established in 1881 by three brothers during the late, uh, the late 1800s. A big Victorian whiskey boom was on the go. Uh, and there's three brothers from the Harvey family. And they, they essentially had a gentleman's agreement whereby that once Brooklady was built and up and running, each of the three brothers uh, would run one of the three family distilleries. There was obviously Brooklady on Isla, but there was also uh, Yoker, and Dundas Hill, both in Glasgow. But in true brotherly fashion, uh, they had a massive fight prior to the Rathladi opening, uh, and that meant the first 20 odd years, 30 odd years of Rathladi's life, 
uh, was tumultuous to say the least. The, the distillery struggled on uh, from its opening in 81 uh, through to 1907 when it closed down, and that really set a pattern throughout the first half of the 20th century. It opened for a few years, then closed. Uh, World War One then opened again and closed in the 20s, reopened in the 30s, closed due to the Second World War. Um, and it really wasn't until we got past the Second World War that Brooklady had some sort of stability. And that's really because it was owned by a series of blending houses. So to start with, it was sold to the DCL in the 1950s. It was then taken over by Inver Gordon Distillers in 1968 and ended up in the arms of Whitey Mackay um, in 1993. I've just praised the guys from White Mackay, but the first thing that White Mackay Company did uh, was essentially to close the distillery um, in the December of 1994. Um, but I said that it was, the distillery was owned by blending houses throughout the second half of the 20th century, and that is really reflected in the style of classic Brute Laddie. A lot of people would think, God, we're off to Isla for the second whiskey and the tasting. That's awfully early to be having a an Isla whiskey, because a lot of people associate Isla whiskies quite rightly with smoke and peat and very rich, robust styles of whiskey. The Brooklady style, though, because it was really part of it was being sold and used for blending, the demand from these blending houses was for unpeated whiskey. So the classic uh, Brooklady style, like those of you that have uh, drum packs will see tonight, um, this is completely unpeated. Um, in 1994, like I say, it was mothballed, uh, and it stayed mothballed right through till 2000, when it was taken over by a private consortium, apart from a very, very short spirit run in 1998. Remember, at this point, even though the distillery was mothballed, it was still owned by White Mackay, who owned Dura, the next whiskey we'll come to tonight. And what happened in 98 was, uh, White Mackay brought some of the production staff over from Dura to Woodlady to do a bit of a spirit run, uh, just to check that the equipment was still in working order. The spirit from that very small run in 98 was bottled as a phased eel bottling, an Iowa Festival bottling in 2011, as the ancient regime uh, 12 year old. So, a very unique uh, Brooklady bottling that one. You can still find it, um, likely at auction now. Uh, keep an eye on the next Royal Whiskey Auctions auction because there might be a bottle there. I don't know. Um, but it reopened, um, it was given a new lease of life at the turn of the millennium, just before Christmas. In 2000, a private consortium led by Mark Rainier, uh, formerly of Murray McDavid Independent Bottlers, uh, led a group of investors to buy the distillery for an absolute bargain of six and a half million pounds. You might think that's a lot of money, and it is. Uh, I heard a story once where uh, the six and a half million quid, it was about half a million pounds for the distillery and the equipment, and the six million was spent on the remaining stock. So you bought a lot of stock. Uh, and up until the distillery was running again and producing uh, and creating mature whiskey uh, in this millennium, what uh, Rainier and the guys that, that owned the distillery had to do was to take a lot of this old stock that was pr produced using knackered old equipment and matured in knackered old casks that wasn't the best quality, um, and they had to re rack them into a lot of different active types of wood. Now, Rainier came from a, a wine background. So you see a lot of bottlings from Brooklady from the 2010s and early 20 teens um, being finished, having secondary maturation in these wine casks, just to give them a bit of a bit of aroma, a bit of flavour, a bit of depth and complexity, and to round them off, give them a bit, a bit of something. Um, but this one here, this 1994, is is absolutely. Uh, it's, I say I tasted it before. It's, it's a cracking example uh, of old style Brooklady. Um, when the distillery did eventually reopen in 2001 after five months of TLC, the first spirit run, strangely, wasn't <coughs> unpeated Brooklady. It was actually the heavily peated Port Charlotte variant. And those of you that are familiar with Brooklady will know they do, do Port Charlotte and they do the Optimore range as well. Port Charlotte is heavily peated. The Optimore range, as Brooklady call it, is super heavily peated. Um, and for a while, there was a bit of a uh, gamesmanship going on between Brooklady and Ardeg as to who could create the smokiest whiskey between different expressions of Optimore and different expressions of Ardeg Supernova. Uh, so the first spirit run was, was Port Charlotte's pieces of 40% at 40 ppm, uh, parts per million phenols, so really quite smoky. Um, the Port Charlotte brand commemorates 
a long lost distillery, uh, the Loch and Dal distillery, which was located two miles south uh, of Brookladdy. It operated for 100 years, <clears throat> from 1829 to 1929, until it was finally closed by the DCL during the mass closures of the 1920s. Um, and all of it was demolished, apart from two warehouses. And it's in these two warehouses that Brookladdy mature the Port Charlotte brand. Uh, in 2012, um, the investors became very, very happy uh, guys because their six and a half million pound investment in 2000 was turned into a 58 million pound sale uh, when still it was sold to Remy Quantro. Still a bargain, if you ask me, to be honest. So we'll get tucked in to the Brook Laddie now. Um, this is a 1994 vintage, 22 years old. It was bought a few years ago, like I say, as part of the rare find range. I had the pleasure of tasting this before, so I know exactly what, what treats we're in for. Yeah, it's got all of that classic freshness from Brook Laddie, quite coastal, very floral. Lots of honey. It's quite buttery, actually, sort of lemon butter. A little touch of toffee and caramel, but it is all, all quite fresh, floral, clean. Coastal styles of pretzels or salted caramel, stuff like that. You really get that saltiness on the palate. Really, I was going to salivate quite a bit. Really salty. It's very clean. Um, a lot of the really creamy uh, tropical fruit notes coming through as well. Um, the info on this one. Uh, so it's filled in March '94, so just uh, about nine months before the distillery was mothballed. Bottled in June 2016, like I say, as a, as a 22 year old. Uh, it's from a refill hogshead as well. It's at 53 and a half percent, so a good, good punchy whiskey uh, as well. Like I say, I do this nostalgic thing as well. So, 1994, what happened then? Uh, Nelson Mandela was elected the South African president when this whiskey was distilled. Uh, the Channel Tunnel opened between England and France, um, and I, I've got to, my guilty pleasure as friends and sitcom that debuted in 1994 as well. In terms of films, we have Forrest Gump, which uh, cleaned up at the following Oscars. We had Four Weddings and a Funeral, we had The Shawshank Redemption, uh, and we had Mrs. Doubtfire, a classic film that is from 94. In terms of music, uh, it was really dominated in the UK by Wet, 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 Love is All Around. Uh, another brilliant dance tune, we had Wakefield, Saturday Night, love that one. Um, and we had D. Reen, Things Can Only Get Better, a very apt for a tasting during a pandemic. Uh, so that's what was going on in the world when this whiskey was being distilled. Um, if you've tasted other Brook Laddies, let me know. If you're tasting this one, let me know if you're enjoying it or what notes you're getting. I'm going to add a little bit of water to this one now. Just a touch. The fruit's really coming through now. Lots of fleshy stone fruits. Pear and apple, banana, pineapple, coconut, all those classic notes that you get from, uh, from ex bourbon casks. Mm. It's a great example of blue pie. Good castle, I think. <laughs> so that's us two whiskies through. A pretty solid start, I think you'll agree. Uh, for the third whiskey, um, like I said, there's no rush. This video will go onto the Edinburgh Whiskey Blog uh, Facebook page uh, once the live stream ends, so you can go back and rewind and go through it at your, at your leisure um, and go through the whiskeys. Like I say, take your time. Um, I'm conscious that you know I could ramble about whiskey for hours. Uh, I don't want to do that tonight because we'll end up with no viewers by the end of the stream. Um, so we'll go through the whiskeys, but by all means, take your time with these drams. Uh, they really fully deserve uh, your time. Uh, focus and, and attention. Um, but when we move on to the third whiskey, which is this one here, um, we're moving now from Isla just over the road, like I mentioned before, 
to Dura. Um, I've already given that a shout out to the guys at White Mackay, so uh, I know you're looking forward to this one. I hope it doesn't disappoint. Um, something a bit oilier, a bit dirtier, a bit richer, a bit more robust. The first two were matured in ex bourbon casks, whereas this one is matured in a sherry hogshead. Now, sherry casks and hogsheads tend to be two separate things. If, like me, uh, right at the start of my whiskey journey 12 years ago, the mantra was uh, bourbon barrels, or ASBs, American Standard Barrels, bourbon barrels and bourbon hogsheads are made from American oak, and sherry butts. Are made from European oak, they come from Spain, and that's the, that's the dichotomy. Quercus alba and Quercus rober, America and Spain. In truth, things are a lot more complicated than that, um, and we're just touching on one of those uh, sort of hybrid casts where it's a, almost a best of, of both worlds with the sherry hogshead. Uh, the hogshead is about 250 litres, the same as a bourbon hogshead would be. It's made from American oak, much like a bourbon hogshead would be. <coughs> Um, but instead of being used to mature bourbon prior uh, to maturing Scotch whisky, it's been used to mature sherry. Now that's a bit of an oddity. These sort of sherry hogsheads made from American oak, they tend to be custom made casks uh, that are produced specifically by the sherry producers in Spain uh, and made specifically for the Scotch whisky industry. Now having the uh, American oak instead of the European oak means that when we look at the colour of this, I'll pour it just now, it's not black like Coca-Cola, for example. If I can get into the sample bottle, there we go. Um, if this was, you know, this is a 43-year-old Jura, if this had been in a, a European oak cask for those 43 years, it would look like Coke. But because it's made of American oak, it's much lighter in colour. And it's not just the colour that will be affected. The aroma and flavour obviously will be as well. So instead of being a what could be a fairly one-dimensional sherry bomb or sherry monster, as we call them, it's a bit more layered, a bit more balanced, and a bit more complex, but all the while having that, that richness that the sherry seasoning brings to the party. Uh, so Jura as a distillery, uh, it was established in 1810, and it ran for all of the 1800s until it was closed um, at the very start of the, of the 20th century. It was initially called the Small Isles Distillery, named after the bay over which uh, the distillery looks where there are five small isles uh, out in the sea uh, and it was closed in 1901 a bit of a dispute between the proprietor of the distillery and the landlord and uh, a, a bit of a set too and that was that was then during 1901 and for a long time a lot of people thought there would be no more uh, whiskey produced on the isle of Jura. that all changed in 1963 during the um the big boom of the 1960s when a lot of distilleries were being built or being expanded. Um, a new one was built, two Jura landowners, Robin Fletcher and Tony Riley Smith got together to build the distillery. It was designed by the famous architect, uh, William Delmy Evans, and it was financially backed uh, by a blending company who resided not too far from here in Leith, uh, Charles McKinley and Co, uh, a big uh, Leith blending house. The main driver, of establishing a distillery on Jura at that time was to prevent the mass migration uh, of particularly younger people that were born on the island, either over to Isla or back to the mainland and to sort of stimulate the local economy. Um, in 1978, the, the distillery was expanded from its initial two stills uh, to four stills. Uh, and the sample we've got tonight comes from that original distillery, just, just two stills. Uh, so this is a, a 19, uh, 76 cask sample. Um, it was going to be the oldest Jura, I think, out there. Um, there might be older ones out there. I've not tasted them. I remember tasting uh, some of the 36 year old single casks. They were 1965 vintages. Uh, they were bottled just after the turn of the millennium. Um, those were fantastic liquids. Um, but this is a 43 year old. I thought it was going to be the oldest one that was out there um, until the brand announced just last week uh, that they were going to bottle. A 1975 vintage uh, at 45 years old. There's only 21 of those bottles going to be available. Uh, I think it's initially matured in bourbon hogsheads and then it's finished in true Richard Patterson style um, in tonic port casks, I believe. I'm surprised it's not Methuselah because he absolutely loves that stuff. Uh, it's matured, uh, it's finished in, in those port casks instead. Um, so, those of you that are enjoying the tasting tonight, if you really enjoy this Jura, keep a look out for one of those 21 bottles. Um, I just hope you have at least six and a half grand spare 
uh, because that's how much that bottle will save you back. Um, we'll get to this cask sample now. Like I say, it's a 76 cask sample, uh, 43 years old from a sherry hogshead. In terms of the strength, we're at 53.1, so we're fairly consistent on the strengths so far. And yeah, we're into a completely different realm compared to those uh, first two whiskies that really played on the lighter, fresher, uh, sort of citrus and fruity side of, well, sort of fruity side of whiskey. When we go right down here in posh territory and antique furniture, very rich and robust. There's still that classic honey note that I get on all Jura, but it's, it's quite it's strange, it's like Manuka honey, it's like darker honey. Bit of canvas and hesse and a lot of called tertiary aromas. Really, really oily as well. It could almost be sort of used tempura oil or something like that. That's a sort of really, really thick oil. It's got those coastal notes there, it's a little bit salty with salted caramel, something like that. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a yeast. Let's taste. Wow, a lot of baking spices there. A lot of clove and cinnamon. It's quite exotic, it's almost like tagine spices. It's got this Moroccan market thing going on. Very exotic indeed. Just checking here, we've got a few people. Um, a lot of people agree this nose is like a rich, privileged person's thing. Really. That is a clap, that is a brilliant nose in whoever's, whoever's brought that one up. Yeah, a lot of, I don't want to sound like Ron Burgundy, but it is like rich mahogany and leather bound books, isn't it? You need to well, have watched the Anchorman film to, to get that reference. Very austere, very elegant. I'm not going to add water to this one. I don't, for me personally, I don't think it needs it. Um, what I find with a lot of whiskies that have matured in sherry casks, regardless of whether it's American or European oak, particularly of this age, if you add a bit of water to this, the whiskey will tend to fall apart. Um, if you add water to uh, whiskies, you know, 20 something or 50 or 30 something as we'll taste shortly, um, that have been matured in bourbon casks, the water tends to integrate a little bit more. It tends to open the whiskey up and evolve the whiskey. Uh, but for me, adding water to a sherry matured whiskey, particularly an old sherry matured whiskey, can sometimes fall apart and fall into sort of two distinct categories the nose and taste. The alcohol, and the sherry, uh, there's no, no real integration. So for me personally, I'm not going to add water to this. Uh, by all means, feel free. If it's a bit spicy, there's a lot of that real sort of tannic, earthy spices coming through. So a little bit of black tea and dark chocolate on the finish, really moving into very, very rich, dark territory. Some of the fruits, I'm not sure if I made it up or if I'm wishing, sort of black forest fruits, sort of morel cherry and blackberry and that sort of thing. Gorgeous whiskey. Oh, I'm going to come back to that one in a little while. That's quite something. Um, I got so wrapped up in the whiskey, I didn't tell you what happened in 1976. So when this whiskey was being filled, uh, when it was being filled into cask, just to give you a sense of exactly how old this whiskey is, um, 1976 was when an apple was formed by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. It was the year that Concord took its first commercial flight. It was also the year that Fidel Castro was elected the Cuban president. That's just to give you a bit, a bit of a sense of how long ago 1976 was. In terms of films, two absolute crackers. We had Rocky and we had Taxi Driver. And in terms of music, I could be here all day listening, banging tunes from this year, but we'll stick to just a few. Elton John and P.D. Don't Go Breaking My Heart came out in 1976. Uh, ABBA, Dancing Queen came out in this year. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody from Queen came out as well, um, and I didn't realise that 76 was also the year that Wild Cherry and Play That Funky Music came out as well, which is just an absolutely brilliant tune. Uh, so that was what was going on in the world when this uh, whiskey was uh, filled into cask. Like I say, this is a cask sample, it's still maturing, it's still a very punchy ABV as well. 
Um, this whiskey could go on for a long, long time to me. 43 years old, not at all tired, show good complexity, uh, good maturity, a lot of very sophisticated, elegant, um, sort of tertiary notes, uh, like I say. Uh, but, but with that sort of strength in the cask, that can comfortably be taken on beyond 50 and, and possibly even longer. Uh, that's that's really quite significant. Very impressive, very impressive indeed. Um, so that's the Jura. Yeah, let me know, Pike and Kai boys, have you tried anything as old as this? Uh, or let me know, what's the oldest stock at Jura? Do you still have stuff from the 60s uh, or the early 70s? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Let me know what you have or what you've tasted, how this compares uh, to the stuff that, that you guys tasted as well. Be very interested to know uh, how this matches up. Um, but yeah, God, that was good. 